All right, welcome to our next class. I hope you all are doing well. I appreciate all the meetings that we've had and how you ask if you need help and we can have our specific Zoom meetings. And if you do need more help and you haven't asked yet, please feel free to. I just want you to know that my main goal is that you are able to learn and absorb this information and really feel confident when you leave here. And if for some reason you don't understand certain content or you don't understand really anything, just let me know and we'll have a meeting and go through it, okay? Especially with this lesson we're about to go through. This is probably the number one, if I could rank, and I think they're all incredibly important, all the lessons that we've had. But in my opinion, this is the number one most important lesson that you're going to get almost in your whole career. Unless at WKU you have another behavior course, then great, that's gonna be a number one course too. But I just want you to know this because like I mentioned before, the number one reason that teachers are leaving the schools like never before is teacher burnout. They're tired. We talked about in a couple lessons ago, if we're not taking care of ourselves with the self-care aspect, if we don't have a good team around us to be supportive of us, if we have student issues or behaviors and we're not you remember we talked about the iceberg, we're only seeing that tip of the iceberg, but we're not seeing everything underneath it, then we're just gonna get tired. And especially if you don't know how to manage those challenging behaviors, then it's gonna be stressful. I think this is the number one reason that teachers get tired, burnt out and leave is because they can't manage their classroom appropriately. And I would say that a large majority of schools do not teach challenging behavior or classroom management hardly at all. It's one lesson out of potentially or potentially one course out of your whole WKU or whatever school these people are at, whatever school it is. So this is huge. So please make sure to follow along. And if you don't get something or understand something after this lecture, please reach out to me because it's very important for your career. And it's not all about assignments or reading guides or your test. I want you to be able to apply this to your life so that you become a great teacher. So keep that in mind. And before I just dash into this, because I typically teach this as a whole entire course, or a two and a half hour lecture at least. So I'm gonna try and condense this down to an hour. Uh, hopefully, let's. I'm gonna make it my goal. All right, so remember back a couple lessons ago, a couple key points that you need to kind of bring back to the forefront of your memory would be, one, what is a function of behavior? So think about that for a second. What do we talk about? What is a function of behavior? So unless you've paused it so you can think longer, the answer is you're trying to figure out why the problem behavior is occurring. That's why we do a functional behavior assessment. That's why we figure out the function of the behavior. Because if you don't know the function of the behavior, you could more than likely be increasing the behavior because you're not aware of what the child is really wanting. So for, I'm gonna just give you a minor example because I'm gonna go through this more later, but if you have a student and they are really wanting to escape the classroom and they are talking back to you, cussing you out, uh, if you're in a high school setting, or maybe they're just kicking or biting like maybe an elementary or middle school student would do. And our first reaction as teachers, because we want to stay safe, is get out of my classroom. You need to leave. But if you do not know that the function of behavior is escape, because remember, what are the three functions of behavior? Attention, escape, and a tangible item, right? Something that they can play with or hold or a toy, whatever that is. So attention, escape, tangible. If you're thinking that the function, or you don't even know the function, or you think it's attention, but the student's real function is escape because they hate your math class and they're just tired of it and they don't want to be there. They don't understand the work. So they bite, kick, cause a problem, do whatever it takes to get out of there. And our first reaction is to say, get out of my classroom. Then if the function is escape, you are reinforcing, which we'll talk about what that means in a minute, reinforcing this escape behavior. So they know now, 
okay, I want to escape this room. So if I do this, this, and this, if I bite, kick, if I rip up the paper, if I cuss the teacher out, then I will be able to leave here. So keep in mind that rarely is any of this stuff that they do, it's rarely personal. It usually comes down to some motivation of something that they want. So you have to be the one to determine what is it they want? What are they trying to get right now? And it's either going to be like we said, I'm going to reiterate this so it gets so stuck in your mind. Attention, they either want attention, escape, or they want a tangible item like an iPad or a phone or toy, whatever that might be. Okay, so that is why this is so crucial that if you cannot determine and accurately assess what's the function of the behavior, then you could very likely keep reinforcing negative behaviors and have a hot mess in your classroom. So please focus in now if you don't understand something because I'm going to go through a lot of content very quickly. Please reach out to me and I'll be happy to go through it with you, okay? So this is, in, is crucial because you remember that a part of a functional behavior assessment, you not only find the function, which is the why, the attention, escape, tangible, but it's also part of the functional behavior assessment is figuring out what happened before the behavior, which is the antecedent, what is the behavior, behavior, right, A, B, C, remember, antecedent behavior, and then consequence. What is happening after the behavior occurs? If you can track those three steps and know, okay, right before the student tried to bite me or rip up this paper, what did I just hand them? Oh, I handed them a math assignment every time right before they bite me. Oh, what happens after they bite me? I kick them out of my classroom. Once I start to notice the patterns, because humans are behaviorally patterned, we do, watch yourself, start to notice if you are reacting out of, out of the attention escape or tangible. So you will, you do it too. So if you can start acknowledging it in yourself, that's a good step. It's, it's very fascinating. Humans are very patterned. So all of that to say, this is crucial that we get this. All right. This is a concept, a foundational concept that you will need to know that's going to govern everything else that we talk about. So these slides here that the, all of these words seem to be pretty confusing if you're just to read this on your own, but it's actually quite simple. This one here says any behavior followed by favorable consequences is likely to happen again. So think about it this way. I'll put it into terms that we would go and interact with tonight or tomorrow or whenever that is. Let's say you go to your favorite restaurant and I'll use myself for an example, since none of you are here, I can't ask you what your favorite foods are, but my favorite food are the enchiladas from a Mexican restaurant in Lexington. I mean, it was my final meal before I left and moved out of that city. It is my top thing. If I go back and visit there, I will be eating Poppy's Mexican restaurant. So enchiladas, my favorite. So let's say I go to a restaurant and I sit down and Marco, which actually owns the restaurant, comes and sits down and puts those enchiladas in front of me. And I taste them for the first time and I think, oh my gosh, these are the best enchiladas I've ever eaten, which is very true in my opinion. So I sit there and I love them. Do you think that I'm going to come back to that restaurant again? Of course, right? It's something I liked. It was favorable to me. I'm going to repeat that same behavior. I'm going to show up at that restaurant and order the same thing or at least order something from there, right? On the flip side, let's say I go sit down in some fancy restaurant and I'm so excited. It looks fantastic in there. And let's say I order this fancy name and I don't know what's in it. Lo and behold, when it's right in front of me and I taste it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is disgusting. What is in here? And they say liver and a mixture of Brussels sprouts. And I think, oh, that just made my stomach turn. I can barely swallow it kind of a food. That is unfavorable to me, right? And that's this point here. If it's unfavorable to me, do you think I'm going to order that again willingly? No, I would say not. So think about yourself. What's your favorite food? 
do you go back over and over again to go eat it? Probably so. What's the least favorite food that you have? You're probably not going to make an effort to repeat that behavior. It's the same for kids, right? If they have something that they like and something is good for them, let's say they love this TV show, they love this snack, they love talking to you because you're nice and kind to them. Maybe they love art, so they love coming to your class because they get to do their favorite things. That is going to be a positive experience. They're going to want to come back again and again or experience that again, right? That's favorable. Same for kids with unfavorable. Maybe the, they hate broccoli, so they're going to try not to eat that. Same for maybe they hate math and or they hate reading. So they're going to try and not repeat that experience again because it's unfavorable to them. Okay. So these two concepts of favorable and unfavorable consequences, you're either going to repeat it again or you're going to try and not repeat it again and escape from it. Right. The, this is the essence of how you shape behavior and it is the result of reinforcement or punishment following a behavior. This Remember we talked about antecedent behavior consequence. If the consequence, what happens after the behavior is good, you're going to do the same cycle again, A, B, C, A, B, C, the same exact steps. If the behavior, let's, like you said, getting that Brussels sprouts and it's disgusting and you hated that you ordered that, you, the consequence is unfavorable so you're not going to repeat it again. That's going to end the cycle or you're going to go pick something else. Okay. So just keep that in mind that this is how we shape behavior. We figure out what is favorable and we try and get them to do that more and more or help the unfavorable thing in regards to school become more favorable for them. So that's a principal concept, but there's more. So keep in mind, there are two principles here. These are terms that you need to know. I'm sure I'm going to put it on the reading guide and I'm sure we're going to show up on the quiz or the test as well at the end. This is what you need to know. When you reinforce, the term reinforce in behavioral terms means that you're strengthening it or you're increasing the behavior. You're reinforcing the behavior and they want to do it again and again and again. Pop Marco's at Poppy's Tacos place reinforces my behavior because the tacos are so good. It's a favorable experience for me. So I'm going to repeat, 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 and that's reinforcement. Punishment is not the term of punishment that we would think in our heads when we think of, you know, we hear about you're in trouble or someone's getting a spanking or they're getting yelled at or time out. It does not necessarily mean that. The term punishment and behavioral aspects here means we are decreasing the occurrence of the behavior. That means the behavior is happening less and less and less. So let me give you an example that is non-school related just to kind of help you wrap your minds around this because I know this is a lot of information. I'm very aware of that. So positive and negative reinforcement. So I have a cat. I think I've mentioned this before. He is peacefully sleeping. I know I've got my my chair right there, you can see the top of his head. He is such a good boy, but he gets himself in trouble quite a bit. And I'm so glad I know behavioral principles because that's the only way I'm surviving with him. And when I first got him, he had some definite behavior issues. So when I first got him, what I didn't know about him necessarily is that if there's any function of behavior that is related to my cat, it would be attention, right? We have attention, escape, tangible. My cat's function of pretty much every behavior is attention, okay? Because he was abandoned at an airport and he thinks that his owners are going to leave him and he has definite issues, <laughs> okay? So if I'm not paying enough attention to him and let's say, unless he's sleeping like right now. And he's like, please play with me, play with me, but I'm not getting the hint, right? And I'm doing my work or doing other things. You know what he would always do initially? He would go scratch my door and you know how they've got these sharp claws and he would just sit up there and scratch my door. And when he did that every time, and it, 
even knowing behavior, it takes us some time to gain what is the pattern that's happening, right? I had to do a functional behavior assessment on him, which is a very true story. So I originally, every time he scratched the door, I would say, Remy, stop it. That's my cat's name, Remy. Remy, stop it. Don't scratch the door. Don't do that again. And I would go over to him, pick him up, hold him, say, don't do that, Remy. What was I giving him? every time i scolded him picked him up went over to him because he scratched the door was i giving him a tangible was i giving him a way escaping something was i giving him attention i was giving him attention which was the function of his behavior so every time i gave him what he wanted which was more attention when he scratched the door he thought oh perfect. This is what I wanted. Every time I scratch the door, I get attention. I'm going to repeat that behavior. So what I unintentionally did was reinforce, which reinforcing means increasing that behavior. I reinforced his door scratching behavior. So stop and think about that a second. Usually we think reinforcing means something good. Did I reinforce or increase a good behavior? No, I reinforced a negative behavior. And this is why this is so important because if you're a mom, if you babysit, if you're in a classroom setting, you can unintentionally, because you don't know the function, you can reinforce or increase a behavior because you just didn't know, right? So once I figured that out, you know what I had to do? I had to do this portion down here, which is punish his door scratching behavior. And remember, I'm not spanking him. I'm not going over there and putting him in timeout. That's not what I mean by punishment. I mean, I'm decreasing and getting rid of hopefully the door scratching behavior. So you know what I had to do? <laughs> this is just a, a good tip. It's called the technical term and you don't need to know this, but it's called differential reinforcement. I will reinforce or increase any good behavior and then ignore any of the negative behaviors. So remember I did a functional behavior assessment on him, on my own cat, which is pretty funny, but you can do it on your kids, you can do it on yourself, you can do it on your students. I thought in my head, okay, what, does, what is he doing every time before he scratches the door? He's typically at my feet looking at me, he's meowing, he's like, please. And then what he does next is roll over. And he rolls over, you know how if you have a cat or a dog, you know, they roll over this kind of playful and they want you to pay attention to them. And if I did not acknowledge the rolling behavior, he went and scratched the door. So I thought, you know what I'll do? Every time he rolls over, I will say, oh, Remy, you're just so cute and go over, play with him. I did this and I faded it out. Obviously, I don't have to do it every time anymore. But initially I did it every single time he rolled over. I would give him attention. And you know what he thought now? He changed his mind. He said, oh, okay. Now every time I roll over, I get attention. So I punished the door scratching behavior because he didn't need to use that anymore. Now I've reinforced or increased his rolling behavior. So that's his signal to me, I need attention. And I he doesn't scratch the doors anymore because of that. So. I just gave that to you as an example to understand. Reinforcement means increasing the behavior. Punishment means I'm decreasing or getting rid of the behavior, just like you did the scratching of the door, okay? So keep that in mind, that's very, very important. And as you can see, this is why teachers have so much trouble in the classroom because they are reinforcing something they don't mean to reinforce, right? Okay. So this is all building on each other. So I hope you're sticking with me and I hope this is making sense. Otherwise, take notes while you're in this lecture because if you're like, okay, on slide three, I totally didn't get what she said. Write it down, send it to me in an email or set up a Zoom meeting with me, okay? Um, so, okay, now you've got this principle. What does the green arrow mean? What is the term for increasing behavior? Think about it a second. The term for increasing a behavior is reinforcing or reinforce right so you increasing the behavior reinforcing the behavior what happens if you decrease the behavior what's the term for that good you should have said punishment 
Decreasing the behavior means punishing the behavior. All right, so if you got that concept down, you're golden. Now let's add another layer onto this. And like I said, I could teach a two and a half hour course on this. So I'm really condensing a lot in one place for you. There are four different types of behavioral actions that you can take. And these are the ones you need to remember. Number one is positive reinforcement. All right, so you know what reinforcement means already. Reinforcement means you're increasing a behavior. And then positive and negative do not mean what they mean to us in normal terms. In behavioral terms, it just means you're adding something. You're adding if it's positive, you're removing if it's negative. So take notes if you, you might need to just literally either take notes and write increased behavior means reinforcement. Decreased behavior means Punishment, sorry, I lost my thoughts for a second. Reinforcement, punishment. Adding or a positive in behavioral terms means adding. Negative in behavioral terms means removing. Okay, so if you can literally, if you just wrote down those four things that I said, you will be able to understand these four concepts in any terms that I ask you, okay? So if positive reinforcement means I'm adding something to increase the behavior, remember, substitute the words positive, add, reinforcement, increase the behavior, add something to increase the behavior. And I'm sorry I'm being so repetitive, but I know some people are going to get this so fast and some people are going to need me to repeat it a few times. So please forgive me if I sound redundant, but it's for a reason. Okay, so an example of positive reinforcement means you're adding something to make the person continue increasing the behavior. So an example in the classroom would be verbal praise. If I tell my students in the classroom and say, you know what, um, I'm, I'm running out of names. You know, I've got, <laughs> there's so many, let's say Michael. You know what, Michael, you did a really good job on your writing assignment. I feel like you used punctuation really well. Your grammar is fantastic. You're just doing an awesome job in this class you think that student is going to increase their writing behavior because they're going to think, oh, she thinks I'm doing a good job. I'm going to do more of it or I'm going to work harder in her class. I am going to offer more. So the goal of giving that verbal descriptive verbal praise is so that you will increase whatever behavior you are saying, wow, good job, All right? If you tell them, I really like how you're walking in that line, if you're working with elementary students, and the students are gonna think, wow, I'm doing such a good job walking in this line, she's happy, I'm going to do that again, and I'm gonna repeat that behavior, okay? Same with a token economy. You could walk around the classroom and have a token in your hand, and every time they do something good or right, you could say, oh, thank you for raising your hand, and place a token in front of them. So they think, oh, every time I raise my hand and don't talk out, I get something. So that's positive reinforcement. Let's move over here. What does negative reinforcement mean? Remember, we mean negative means you're removing. Negative means remove. Reinforcement means to increase the behavior, right? So an example of this, this is one, negative reinforcement is probably the, one of the hardest out of the four to understand. So an example of negative reinforcement would be nagging. So when somebody's trying to, they're trying to get out of the situation, they're increasing their behavior to get out of that situation is basically what that means. So if your mom or your dad or your aunt, grandma, whoever is mainly in your life comes to you and says over and over, you know what, you just never clean your room you don't do a good job at this. Why aren't you cleaning your room? And they say it so many times because that's what nagging is. It's just going, you're doing this wrong. Why aren't you doing this? Or teachers do it in the classroom. None of you all do any type of help in cleaning this room, this classroom. Why aren't you picking up the books? Why aren't you in class on time? Why? And if you are just so sick of it and you just can't stand to hear them nag another second, right? You want to remove this stimulus, which a stimulus just means whatever's happening to you at the time. 
if you've got your mom in front of you who's nagging, 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 you're like, oh my gosh, just stop saying that. I will clean my room, okay? So you try and clean your room so that you can get her to stay quiet. You want her to stop nagging you. So you are, she's unintentionally, but truly reinforcing this nagging behavior. She's reinforcing your ability to clean your room because every time she nags, you go and clean your room. She's increased your behavior, but because you're trying to escape from something, her nagging, okay? So that's what negative reinforcement looks like. It's just the same in the classroom. Um, if your students, uh, you're singing a song in the classroom and you say, I'm gonna sing this song until you, actually all get up and get in the line and she starts singing the teacher starts singing a song that you just hate and you're like oh my gosh this is grating on my nerves everybody get in the line real quick because we have to get her to stop singing that is an example of negative reinforcement okay there she's increased their line behavior getting in line but it's because they're trying to escape you <laughs> that's basically what that means okay so positive reinforcement negative reinforcement two more here. You're doing so good hanging on with me. I know it's so technical, but it's so important. Um, this one, if you know what pos what does positive mean again? Positive means to add. You're adding something. Punishment means you are decreasing the problem behavior. So an example of this, and we're going to go through all these later, but if you don't know what these four different types of behavioral terms mean you'll be lost. So I want to make sure to touch on this. So you're adding something that's decreasing the behavior. So an example of that would be a term called overcorrection. Have you ever had somebody in your life come to you? Let's say a student or maybe when you were a kid, you slammed the door, right? You slammed the door and you're mother or teacher did not like that you did that. So what they say is, come back over here, come here. Now take this door handle and I want you to shut it the right way. And so what that is, is they're adding something, you're, they're making you do something to make you stop or decrease the behavior of slamming the door. So you come over to the door handle and you go, oh, okay, okay. And you shut the door nicely. And then maybe the teacher or the mom goes over, over correction means they're overdoing it. And they say, okay, thank you for doing that one time. Let's do it again. Open the door and shut it the correct way. And maybe they have you do that five times, right? <laughs> you could say, okay, shut the door. And because they had you practice it the right way five times, you're going to get so sick of that. You're probably not going to slam the door again. And that's decreasing the slamming of the door by making you do something or adding something. So that's positive punishment. Uh, what do you think another example of that behavior would be? It could be in the classroom. Um, it could be you mess up on your assignment. Let's just go ahead and use math. I seem to use that a lot. Let's say either math or reading. I mean, honestly, it could be a writing assignment. So let's say you write your F and you're in an elementary classroom and they write the F backwards, which a lot of students do. And you could say, oh, we don't write our Fs that way. How we do this is we write it like this, write it like me. And then the student takes their pen and they have to write it like you. And you tell them, okay, write 10 Fs. So they, I shouldn't have used F because it makes it sound like I'm giving them an F, but that's, I should have used A, it would have been kinder, but they, they have to write F, 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 F. They're trying to add or make them do something to decrease that bad writing of the F backwards. They're not supposed to write it that way. So that's what overcorrection or positive punishment looks like. You have them do something over and over or do something again so that they don't do it the wrong way next time. Okay. You're doing great. Here's the fourth one. You might have to go back and watch this one or two times. So keep that in mind, but I promise you this will all come together and be extremely helpful for you. Um, 
so over here we have negative punishment. That is the last example. So negative punishment. So remember the word negative in behavioral terms means remove. So you're removing something. Punishment means to decrease the behavior. So you are removing something to decrease their behavior. A couple examples of that. Time out. This is a very common example of negative punishment. You could have a student who, let's say they stuck their tongue out at you, they took their friend in school, they took their backpack or took their pin or whatever that might be or got into a fight or an argument in an elementary setting and you could say, okay, I'm removing you, which remember negative means remove. I'm removing you from the situation to decrease that behavior. So since you stole the backpack or because you um, hit your brother or your friend at school, you need to sit over here and time out. You're removing them from the situation to hope that it will cause them to decrease that behavior. So maybe they have to sit in time out for five minutes. I'm sure if you have kids or if you have you babysit or if you worked with kids at all, this seems to be a fairly common one that people use and you say, okay, sit in time out five minutes. You don't get to play anymore for you, usually you set the timer for very close to what their age is. That's typically a rule of thumb. So let's say they sit out for five minutes and they're like, oh, but please, can I play? I really want to play. And you go, nope, I'm sorry. You have to sit over here. And you're hoping that because they want to play so bad and they don't like to be in timeout that they will stop doing the bad behavior or the negative behavior. Okay. So I hope that makes sense to you. Just remember these boxes, go back through there. Just like I said, if you haven't written this down yet, you should increase behavior. The term that's equal equals reinforcing or reinforce. Decrease behavior in behavior terms equals punishment. Positive in behavior terms equals add. Uh, negative in behavior terms equals remove. So if you know those definitions and you've written that down, you could come up anything I ask you on the reading guide or on a future test, you should be able to figure it out, okay? So they have given you a, a lot there, a lot of really good information. And just remember, I'm gonna end it with this before I, I'm gonna just kind of cut it short and move on to the next section here in a second. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I do not have coronavirus anymore, so. <laughs> I'm healthy again, I don't know I'm coughing. So if you look here, this is an example of positive reinforcement. Teachers can use these things inappropriately if they don't know how they are supposed to work. If you don't know the function of behavior, you're more than likely going to reinforce or increase things that you don't want to reinforce. So for example, so we have the antecedent, which is what's happening before the behavior. So you see, teacher is not paying attention to Russell. Just kind of how I was not paying attention to my cat. So you've got Russell, here's the teacher. Russell, what does he have in the corner? Our students do not have this kind of contraption, but they make their own, <laughs> you know, within their own selves. He's over there clapping, dancing, he's got this horn blaring, this clown on this machine. He's like, hey, look at me, look at me, but he's not saying that, but that's what he wants. So behavior, Russell deploys attention getting device, and our students do that without the machine. Like I said, that's the behavior. The consequence is that teacher takes Russell into the hallway and says, Russell, why are you doing that? Come out here and talk to me. Talks to the student sternly, about his behavior. So what did she just do? He was wanting attention. And since he used his device, he's, that worked. Perfect, I got her attention. She took me to the hallway, she was talking to me, she was giving me one-on-one -on -one attention. This is just great. This is exactly what I wanted. So what is Russell going to think? Well, guess what's working? What just worked right before the consequence? this. 
the behavior getting attention seeking device worked. So what is he going to do next class? He's going to do the same machine again and probably amp it up a bit. So each time he does it, she's going to talk to him, give him a stern scolding, and she's reinforcing a behavior she did not want to reinforce. And we as teachers do that all the time, right? The teacher, let me go back one. The teacher did not want him using the device again, but because she reinforced his attention seeking behavior in the wrong way, the outcome is Russell's more likely to use this device in the future to get attention. So think about this because I'm sure you've experienced this before and you've had students. Um, that's why it's crucial to use the functional behavior analysis to determine a pattern through the antecedent behavior consequence and decide, are they doing this right now to get attention? Are they doing this right now to get out of my classroom or get away from me or stop doing their assignment? Or are they trying to get back to their cell phone or get food or get whatever item that they want? If you can figure that out accurately first, you can use the appropriate behavior management strategy to either reinforce, increase that behavior or punish and decrease it and make that behavior go away. Okay, so I'm gonna end it there because I think we reached close to the 30 minute mark and then I'm gonna start a new session saying how we're gonna apply this specifically in our classrooms, okay? All right, great job. I appreciate your attentiveness and how well you're doing. Keep it up and hopefully you took some good notes so you can remember all this. All right, I will see you in the next part of the lesson.